In this lecture video, we covered the topic of causality as it relates to the general linear model. Now, you've probably heard the statement, correlation does not equal causation. And I think that this statement is the source of a lot of confusion among students, because you've learned about correlation as a method of data analysis. So as long as we avoid that technique, we can just make causal interpretations, right? Wrong. The topic of causality is relevant for you any time you want to interpret the results of your analyses. Any time you want to draw inferences about relationships between variables, you can't avoid having to consider causality. Now, social scientists are often reluctant to make their causal assumptions explicit, but it's important to realize that any time that you interpret the results for a study, in order to influence practice or policy or recommendations for treatment or give sales advice. Any time you try to use the results of a study to make actionable decisions, you are making causal interpretations. And some of those interpretations might be wrong. So with this in mind, it's very important to get ahead of the game and make your causal assumptions explicit so you know what conclusions are supported by your data and which ones are not. In previous lectures, I already alluded a little bit to causality and I explained that very often people tend to use bivariate regression analysis if they believe that the predictor is a cause of the outcome and they want to know how large its effect is. And people use correlation analysis if they don't have a theory about which variable causes which. And today we're going to expand our understanding of causality a little bit. Just like with bivariate regression, for multiple regression it's often the case that people who use it are interested in finding causal relationships. So where a predictor x is believed to cause the outcome y. Anytime we use the results from an analysis to inform which treatment we apply, or which policy decisions we make, or what stocks we invest in, or what sales decisions we make, any time we change our behavior based on the outcome of an analysis, we must have causally interpreted its results. Because if we don't assume causality, it doesn't make sense to change our treatment, policy decisions or investments based on the results of that analysis. But the problem is that causality can only be established using experiments with random assignment, or assumed based on theory. And if we rely on theory to assume causality, it's crucial that we correctly represent that theory in our analysis. Because if the theory is wrong or incorrectly represented by the analysis, then all of our results will be misleading. I'm going to re-examine possible relationships between variables from the perspective of causality. And just for simplicity's sake, we start with bivariate relationships, the relationships between two variables. And those are represented here below in what I call box diagrams. So each variable or construct is represented by a box, and these arrows indicate the direction of causality. With two variables, we have three possible situations. One situation is that variable A causes variable B. The second situation is that variable B causes variable A. And a third situation is that they both cause each other. Crucially, there is no statistical way to determine whether situation A is true or situation B is true or situation C is true. That's the realm of theory. So you have to use theory to decide if you are in situation A or situation B or situation C. With three variables, we are looking into trivariate relationships, the situation becomes even more complex. Here too, we can distinguish three possible situations. One is a common cause situation. So here we have two variables, A and C, and they're both caused by a third variable, B. So B is a common cause of A and C. This is also called a fork because B forks to A and C. The second possible situation is called an indirect effect. 
Here, variable A has a causal effect on B, and B has a causal effect on C. So A has an indirect effect on C via B. So if I go up on A, that causes an increase in B, and that increase in B in turn causes an increase in C. And the third situation is what we call a collider. In this case, both A and C are causes of B. So these are two independent causes of the variable B. First, let's delve into the common cause scenario a bit deeper. This is the fork diagram on the left. In this case, A and C share their common cause B. That means that any changes in B cause changes in both A and C. And that will result in covariance between A and C. So if you are only studying the relationship between A and C, that relationship will be distorted by any effects of B. In this context, we call B a confounder. And controlling for the confounder B is good and is necessary if you want to study the unbiased relationship between A and C. So let's look at an example of confounding. We have three variables. We have exercise and smoking and lung cancer. It's well known by now that smoking is a cause of lung cancer, but it may also cause a decrease in exercise because people who smoke tend to be out of breath more easily and people who smoke tend to have lower general fitness, so we would expect a negative effect on exercise. If we ignore smoking and just look at the relationship between exercise and lung cancer, then we would observe a negative effect of exercise on lung cancer. But this effect is spurious, that means it's an illusion. It appears only because smoking is a negative cause of exercise and a positive cause of lung cancer. Another example of confounding could be found in developmental psychology. In this case, the variables are the child's age, the child's height, and the child's vocabulary. How many words do they know? So age is a mutual cause of height and of vocabulary, because older kids tend to be taller and they tend to know more words. But if you ignore age and you just look at the relationship between height and vocabulary, you would find a spurious positive effect of height on vocabulary. So it appears that being taller causes kids to know more words. But if you would control for age, this effect would disappear. Just like if you were to control for smoking, this spurious negative effect between exercise and lung cancer would also disappear. Here is an example based on some real research. The three variables in question were low socioeconomic status neighborhood, whether people received financial aid from the government, and whether people experienced life struggles. So a study found that people who received aid from the government tended to experience more life struggles subsequently. And they use this as an argument to reduce government aid because it only caused people to struggle more. But in fact, there was a confounder which was not taken into account, which was where people lived, whether people lived in a low socioeconomic status neighborhood. Because living in a low socioeconomic status neighborhood was both a cause of receiving aid and of experiencing more life struggles because such neighborhoods are generally underfunded and have fewer facilities. So after you control for whether people lived in a low socioeconomic status neighborhood or not, this spurious positive effect of receiving aid on experiencing life struggles disappeared. The second scenario that I described was the indirect effect. And this is also sometimes called mediation or a chain relationship. In this case, the variable B is a process variable or an intermediate step in the relationship between A and C. In this case, if we control for the mediator B, that hides the indirect causal association between A and C. So one example is shown in the graph here. Our studied causes increased understanding of the material an increased understanding of the material causes a higher grade for the exam. So in this case, if you control for the effect of understanding, the effect of our studied on grade will disappear 
because the effect of hours studied on grade is explained by an increase in understanding. Also, if I already know how well someone understands the material, then knowing how much they studied provides no additional relevant information for predicting the grade, because the effect of hours studied is mediated by people's understanding. Mediation can also be partial, so in this case, we are looking at three variables, socioeconomic status, taking regular screenings for different types of cancer, and the probability of surviving cancer if you are diagnosed with it. So what we see here is that taking regular screenings is a mediator of the effect of socioeconomic status on surviving cancer. People who live in high socioeconomic status neighborhoods tend to have money and doctors available to do regular cancer screenings. And because they do regular screenings, cancer is detected early and their probability of surviving cancer goes up. But even after controlling for the number of screenings taken, socioeconomic status still has a direct effect on cancer survival because people in low socioeconomic status neighborhoods also have less nutritious diets, they may be exposed to environmental pollutants, they have less facilities to take care of them, so there still remains a direct effect of socioeconomic status on probability of cancer survival, even after controlling for the mediator screening. And this is called partial mediation. And finally, the third situation is called colliding. So colliding occurs when two unrelated variables both cause a third variable. In this case, if you were to control for that third variable, we would introduce a spurious statistical relationship between the two unrelated variables. This is also called a common effect relationship. The third variable B is a common effect or an outcome of both A and C. In the case of colliding, you absolutely do not want to control for B when studying the relationship between A and C, because controlling for B would create a spurious relationship between A and C. This is a huge problem. First, let me lightheartedly introduce it with the following example. Let's consider three variables, whether or not someone is attractive, whether or not someone has acting talent, and whether or not someone has a successful career in Hollywood. So we can assume that being attractive and having acting talent are both predictors of having a successful career in Hollywood. For example, Steve Buscemi, huge acting talent, very unattractive in my opinion. I'm sorry if you're out there, Steve Buscemi. On the other hand, Brad Pitt, very attractive. Acting talent, yes, I'm going to say Brad Pitt also has high acting talent but it wouldn't be necessary for him to have a successful Hollywood career because he's so attractive that even if he were a terrible actor, he could still be successful in Hollywood. So attractiveness and acting talent are independent causes of having a successful Hollywood career. But if we were to examine the effect of attractiveness on acting talent and we controlled for whether or not people had a successful Hollywood career, we would introduce a spurious positive relationship between attractiveness and acting talent. And if we were to just blindly interpret this without thinking about the causality of the underlying variables, we might conclude that being attractive is a contributing cause of having acting talent, which of course it isn't. But colliders can also sneak up on you. Here's a really treacherous example. Let's say our three variables are cognitive impairment, subjective quality of life, and a third variable is whether or not someone participated in your study. So you could imagine that people who experience a cognitive impairment are less likely to participate in your study because it's more of a challenge for them. And you might also expect that people who have a lower quality of life are also less likely to participate in your study, perhaps because they are just too depressed to do so. And that if this is the case, we would experience a spurious negative relationship between cognitive impairment and quality of life just by analyzing the data in our sample, because the data in our sample are already controlled for whether or not people participated in our study. So this is something you definitely want to give some thought to. 
In sociology, this is called a selection effect, and it happens any time whether or not someone participated in your study is a collider of the effects that you're studying. So this is just a brief primer on causality. And the main message that I want you to take home is that assuming that your model is correctly specified, controlling for confounders will improve the causal inferences you draw from your model, but controlling for a collider is a deadly sin and it's going to bias any causal inferences drawn from your model. So don't just put everything into your model without having a very good reason and try to always draw these kind of box diagrams to think about the causal relationships between the variables that you studied and maybe even some that you didn't study. If you want to know more about causality, I cannot recommend Judea Pearl's book, The Book of Why, highly enough. It's just excellent holiday reading material, very accessible. There's also this blog post on causal inference and there is this paper, which is also co-authored by Judea Pearl. It's called A Crash Course in Good and Bad Controls, and this lecture was heavily influenced by it. So just to close, let's look at this cartoon from XKCD. Person says, I used to think correlation implied causation. Then I took a statistics class. Now I don't. Sounds like the class helped. Well, maybe. It depends on your causal assumptions, of course. Equipped with this understanding of causal assumptions, you are well on your way to becoming a distinguishing user of the general linear model. So keep this material in the back of your mind any time that you use a statistical analysis technique, and don't be afraid to come back to this video now and then. Good luck with the tutorial exercises, and see you next week. Hey buddy. Who's your bunny?